Are you ready, kids? Let's swab the deck, peer at the deep on the starboard side, and roll some bones because it's time to talk about Pirate Borg. Wow, I am not the guy to do pirate impressions. Hi, William Tramp, also known as This F and GM here, and today I want to talk to you about my experience playing Limithron's Pirate Borg, a drug-infused game of swashbuckling, undead slaying, and trying to survive the high seas of the dark Caribbean. But first, a disclaimer. Recently, I had a chance to play Pirate Borg with Zach Goins, the marketing manager of Limithron and my soon-to-be very best friend, and I had a blast. But I should be upfront, while I am not being paid to make this particular video, I did receive a free copy of the game from Limithron in the hopes that I would like it and talk about it. Also, Zach and I played together in a completely different game in person on Sunday nights, but we're not here to talk about that. Basically, I'm trying to tell you I'm a little biased, but most of that bias was based on having a fun freaking time playing this game. So though I am not being paid to talk about this, I'm going to and happily. So Zach invites myself, Dave, and Devin to play through The Repentant, an adventure that Zach wrote for the upcoming Kickstarter by Limithron, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Our ragtag crew consisted of Jean, a musket-toting buccaneer with a penchant for psychedelics who is played by Dave, Pirate Will, a zealous follower of Mother Earth with a hankering for alcohol played by Devin, and Steed, a corpulent swashbuckler with a desperate need to be liked played by me. A desperate need to be liked, eh? Sounds pretty on brand for this effing GM. Our adventure was set in the Dark Caribbean, Pirate Borg's personal setting, a somewhat alternate history Caribbean Isles location. What's the difference, the biggest difference between the real Caribbean and the dark Caribbean? Well, the presence of an impossible amount of undead, called the Scourge, who infest the islands and surrounding waters, waiting to pull unsuspecting sailors down into the drink. Now, of course, undead aren't the only menace in the area. Fish people, Cthulian whores, the French, and even vampires also haunt these waters looking to interact with your characters in not-so-cuddly fashions. Now you might ask yourself, why go to the Dark Caribbean with all of these whores, like the French, waiting to waylay you? Well, in addition to ruins filled with treasure and a general cool vibe of being a pirate in the Dark Caribbean, the area is also the world's only source of ash, a psychedelic drug that can fetch high prices on the black market. And this is where our crew comes in. After a lucrative run on the Isles, our ship was caught in a supernatural storm of epic proportions and left stranded on a sloop in the ocean with no recourse. The rest of the crew was dead and only the three of us had survived. Mother Earth, who Steed prefers to call Mum, smiled upon us though and soon we were picked up by a traveling brigandine called The Repentant. That's the title. Once aboard the ship, we discovered that we must have pissed off Mom something fierce as we were thrown into the brig and to make matters worse, the entire hold surrounding us was filled with the living dead who stood a century over our captured crew. Well. Things didn't necessarily get better for us as the living crew of the ship tried to drug us and sacrifice us to some demons, but through some hard work and determination, I'm lying. Through sheer dumb luck and more than a few well-placed healing spells, we were able to persevere and get ourselves a brand new ship, crew, and a fancy meat grinder which we used to make more ash. Did I forget to mention? The psychedelic drug Ash is processed from the bodies of the undead. We had to go all kinds of Fargo on the Repentant to make that happen. Anyway, it was a ton of fun. You know what, I want to talk a bit about how the gameplay of Pirate Borg compares to my experience with other systems. The gameplay of Pirate Borg was exactly as advertised. Rules light, dangerous, and random as hell. We began our session with character generation, which utilizes a number of random tables, if your group chooses to, to determine everything about your character from class to abilities to what type of rad hat you get to imagine your character wearing. Mine had a feather in it. The class system of Pirate Borg is a pretty innovative overlay to add on top of the Mork Borg base system. Each class determines your starting hit points, grants some pluses and penalties to abilities, some random starting gear, and a random ability to make your character feel more unique compared to the rest of the crew. Advancement, which we did not get into, typically involves more HP, which is sorely needed in a board game, and another random ability. Now one thing I noted when I first started looking through the book is that some classes had a longer advancement life, meaning that they could continue to advance and take the same abilities multiple times, getting better at what they are able to do, but some classes do not and have a hard cap. I asked Zach about this, and he confirmed to me that this intention was twofold. 
First, advancement in a board game is not like Dungeons and Dragons or its derivatives, where advancement is expected after every few sessions of play and campaigns are made to last years. In Borg, advancement is few and far between, requiring players to accomplish major feats rather than just slaying a number of creatures to accumulate murder points. I mean experience points! The second intention is that if you do find yourself in a game that does span months or years, then once you achieve the pinnacle of one class, you just start taking levels in another, which honestly, I think is pretty interesting. Of course, having a character live that long is easier said than done. Now, one aspect of board games like Pirate Borg that really stands out to me is that the players generally roll everything. Initiative, for example, is done with a d6 roll, and a player makes that roll. They roll high, the players go first, whatever order they want. They roll low, the enemies go first, whatever order the game master wants. Are they called game masters in this, or is it a captain? Ooh, maybe a ship master. I, I should have looked that up before I started this video. But it's more than just initiative. Enemies don't roll attacks. That's handled like skills are in many other games. The game master sets the difficulty class, the DC, usually a 12, and players roll to defend against. If the player fails, damage. Luckily, armor reduces that, but good luck getting a hold of full plate in the dark Caribbean. Am I right? I am right. It is not easy to find full plate in the Caribbean. This reminds me a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games, creating a game in which the GM is a little more free to focus on the narrative and reactions to the player's shenanigans and giving players the feeling that they are more in control of their destiny. I like this a lot. Class abilities are simple, mostly just creating a permanent modification to specific skill rules, but every so often granting a special power only you can use. For instance, we lucked out by having our zealot, Pirate Will, roll for one spell known and he got a healing power. Hey, thanks Pirate Will. Your madness induced healing really saved my character's bacon. On the note of being saved, hit points are not heroic levels in the board games. If you're lucky and you roll well, you can end up like Jean and have damn near 25 hit points. Or you could end up like me and have seven. Random rolling, baby. And let me tell you, when you're playing the frontline warrior and you only have seven hit points and no guarantee of advancement anytime soon, you absolutely change how you play to compensate for that. And I am tickled that we were able to earn our victory on the Repentant. And that's what a dangerous system does. And it's something I appreciate immensely. Every victory feels like a victory because it's clear all throughout the process that the cards are stacked against you. For many, this is not the playstyle they prefer, and I absolutely understand that. But I do want to point out, if character generation in your game of choice could be accomplished with a few rolls of the dice and a couple of minutes writing on the sheet, do you think character death would feel as devastating as those that take like half an hour? I know I don't. Anyway, moving back real quick to the topic of skills, I probably should mention this is not a skill-based system. It's really an ability role-based system. The main difference is that when you have a system that is based on abilities, anything your character attempts will typically be relegated to a role of one of these modifiers, like six of them. In a skill-based system, specific minute differences are made between certain types of skills. While many have their preference, I'm starting to gravitate towards skill-less systems. And the reason why is that when you place a list of four to five ability scores, this tends to lead to more freedom and action than when you give someone a list of 30 skills to have to sort through. Often, skill lists tend to restrict actions more as many seem to interpret the skills and subsequent bonuses skill systems provide as being the only real options for action in a game. Okay, that was a little bit of a digression, but it is something I notice and appreciate about more rules light systems such as Pirate Borg. Now, without having a host of special abilities and special situational modifiers to choose from, gameplay is much faster as most of the time spent between turns can be devoted to paying attention to what others are doing and adjudication of each action is as simple as making a choice between five abilities and getting a roll. I loved it. And it was insane to me that in two hours we were able to get through a ton, being primarily limited by our own inability to resist role playing the hell out of our deeply flawed crew members. Side note, flaws truly are one of the best parts of any role playing game and Pirate Borg has them. 10 out of 10. I would always recommend being a 1 out of 10. Now, Zach did have a secret agenda for inviting two YouTubers to his game. After the game was over, he took some time to talk to us about Limithron's impending Kickstarter for two brand new books, Down Among the Dead and Cabin Fever. The first book, Down Among the Dead, is a resource designed to expand what you can do with the Pirate Borg system. 
In addition to new house rules to be used in the game and a coral reef generator, the book boasts at least 10 new classes, including the Supernatural Tattooed and the Privateer, a class designed to allow the players to start as a member of one of the big factions like Spain or France before ultimately joining the Pirates of the Dark Caribbean. Gotta be careful, Will. You don't want to draw the attention of Disney. Also included in Down Among the Dead are three new adventures. Lost in the Locker, described by Zack as a sort of underwater version of hell. Venom in the Veins, a dungeon crawl through a snake temple. Why did it have to be snakes in a motherfucking temple? Oh, why am I trying to combine that? I'm so sorry. And Into the Maelstrom, a sort of Ravenloft homage involving a dark ship commanded by a vampire. I asked Zack if we could also bring along a vampiking and a vampaladin to take on this threat, but Zack didn't think that was on brand. I think the most exciting reveal to me about this book was the presence of dice drop maps. This is a new thing to me, a map with accompanying random tables where the idea is you drop a number of dice on the map and then use the random tables to determine what populates the map and then use the dice to placement to determine where they live. I think there's also versions in which the dice also determine the layout of the map. I think this is very a very neat design element. Overall, Down Among the Dead is projected to be around 120 to 140 pages of all new content, which is a great amount for any pirate board Shipmaster, Game Master, Master of the Seas. Dang it, I, I really need to go look that up. The second book in the Kickstarter is one that I am particularly excited for, and it's Cabin Fever. And not just because the repentant adventure that Zach ran for us will be in it, but you see, Cabin Fever is a collection of fan-made adventures and content. The story behind this is Limithron held a contest for content and were so blown away by the submissions, they decided to make an entire book and kickstart it. All of the contestants whose content will be in the book were not only paid for their work, they also retained the rights to that work so that they may release their own separate products. Not only that, but in an effort to not make too much of a profit off of the work of others, consumers can enjoy a free PDF of Cabin Fever, as there are no plans by Limithron to charge others for the privilege of trying out the amazing work put forward by their community. Now, of course, the hardcovers will have a price tag, but publishing is expensive, man. Not only does the Down Among the Dead Kickstarter include these two books, but also special Jolly Roger dice sets, a uh, patch of the new threat, Cheron, a Game Master screen, and most importantly, wait, am I allowed to talk about this yet? Maybe not. I'm going to anyway. A Pirate Borg Starter Set. Starter sets are all the rage right now in tabletop role-playing games, and it's easy to understand why when you look at the contents of the Pirate Borg starter set, the first Borg product starter set that's been announced, at least that I know of. In the box, we're looking at new maps, a new adventure trapped in the tropics, laminated character sheets, quick start rules, dice, and combat tokens for naval combat. As a terrain using Game Master myself, I am all about physical props on the table. And if you have ever looked at the price of 3D ships, then you know that having a set of ship tokens is going to be great on the old wallet. This is very exciting to me. The Kickstarter for Down Among the Dead, Cabin Fever, and the starter set will be hitting Kickstarter in just a few weeks. If you use the link in the thing below, then you can not only get notified when it drops, but you can also get a limited run of a cheer on coin for only a dollar added to your pledge. I think that's pretty dang neat and I've already signed up myself. I have never considered myself a big fan of the pirate zeitgeist. I suppose we all have the things that we gravitate towards in popular culture and the idea of sailing on the high seas was never something that grabbed me. But Pirate Borg has sort of turned me around at least a bit on this. Maybe it was the enthusiasm of my buddy Zach in the game that he ran, or maybe it's the rules light system that still provides enough customization to feel unique, or maybe I'm just enamored with the promises of the Kickstarter and seeing a smaller publisher reach greater heights. Hell, let's be real. I'm mainly excited because I'm absolutely taking a look at my favorite sandbox adventure, The Dark of Hot Springs Island. I'm going to try to see how well this system and list adventure will run with Pirate Borg. Spoiler, very well it would seem. Either way, I hope that you too are tempted to put together a ragtag crew of salty swashbugglers and spooky sorcerers after hearing about my experience with the game. Check out the base game in the thing below, and then give the Kickstarter a look, and I'll put that link in there when it launches. Either way, I've got some work I gotta do now, so I'm gonna go ahead and walk the plank and catch you all later.